At the beginning of the film, a group of rebels were holding high school students captive. The rebel group held the students captive in a school building and would not let them go before the government transferred the ransom money according to what they wanted. At the same time, the mayor was seen contacting the police chief to give orders and ask them to just fight against the rebel group. The police chief quickly assigned a special forces captain named Mason to mobilize his team to fight the rebels. Then Mason immediately sent his team to the crime scene while Mason and the police chief would monitor from a distance. Here, Mason entrusted this mission to one of his subordinates, Connor. Soon, Connor and his team went to the crime scene. When they arrived at the scene, Connor told Mason that it was impossible for his team to enter because all the school buildings were locked. So, the only way was to launch a bazooka to the school building. Because there was no other choice, finally, Captain Mason ordered one of his men to launch a bazooka. The situation became chaotic and fortunately, the students who were being held captive were still safe. In fact, each of them was able to escape after the explosion. After that, Connor and the team immediately entered the building and there was a shooting. In the middle of the battle, the leader managed to take one student hostage so that Connor couldn't move. But the rebel leader accidentally stepped on a mine and there was a big explosion. As a result of the explosion, Connor and the team were blown quite far and several students had to become victims. 18 months later, Connor was transferred to become a police officer. Since the explosion that killed several students, Connor's special forces team had to be disbanded because the mission was considered a failure. This time, Connor was waiting for his brother because he was going to ride in Connor's car to his campus. But when Connor's brother was walking, suddenly he was chased by a member of the mafia. Seeing this, Connor ran to help his brother. Connor's brother was caught and then beaten several times, but fortunately, Connor came and immediately intervened. Here, Connor tried to nicely ask the Mafia about what the problem was, but the Mafia instead took out a gun, and this is what happened. Finally, the Mafia member died and Connor immediately asked his brother to leave. Not long after, a Mafia boss, Pettis, and two of his men came and immediately held Connor at gunpoint. Here, Connor chose not to fight because he could explain the incident well. Connor said that Pettis' man was the one who took out a gun first, so Connor was forced to finish him off. However, Pettis, the Mafia boss, didn't want to hear any excuses, especially since the person Connor had killed was his favorite man. Then Pettis said that Connor's brother was an addict and he had a debt to Pettis. Therefore, Connor's brother was being chased because his debt had not been paid. And now, everything was too late so Connor had to pay for what he did. Pettis would not kill Connor for now, because he had his own way to make Connor's life miserable. A few hours later, Connor was being interrogated by two police detectives regarding the death of one of the Mafia boss's men. Connor tried to explain that he was only defending himself because Pettis' man was the one who took out his gun first. However, for some reason, the two detectives blamed Connor he was even immediately fired that day from the police. Then, Connor was released on parole, but if he caused trouble one more time, he would be thrown into prison. The scene moves showing the Mafia boss, Pettis, who was involved in a serious conversation with the police chief. The fact was that Pettis was the biggest Mafia, as well as the drug dealer in this city. It wasn't clear yet what they were talking about, but they definitely seemed to be close. The next day, Connor would take his wife for her monthly shopping. On the way, Connor's wife said that they would soon have a baby because she was pregnant. When Connor heard this, of course he was very happy. Moreover, he had always wanted a child. Connor immediately treated his wife like a queen because he didn't want her wife to be too tired. After shopping, when Connor was about to enter his car, but suddenly Pettis' right-hand man immediately strangled him until he fainted. When Connor woke up, his hands were already handcuffed to the steering wheel of his car, and his wife had been kidnapped by Pettis. Not long after that, Pettis came and said that if Connor wanted his wife to be safe, then Connor had to replace Pettis' money amounting to $2 million. Connor was confused and didn't understand what money Pettis meant. Then, Pettis explained that his man, who Connor killed, always made $2 million every month. Because Connor finished that man, so now Connor was the one who had to pay the money for this month. If not, then Connor's wife would become a victim. 
Pettis gave Connor one day, and he would wait at his headquarters. Connor asked where he could get $2 million in one night, then Pettis answered if Connor could steal it from his business rival. Pettis also gave his business rival's address, so like it or not, finally, Connor obeyed all of Pettis' orders for the sake of his wife's safety. After that, the first person Connor visited was his younger brother, who was a former Special Forces officer and had been on the same team as him. But when he got there, his little brother didn't want to open the door because he felt he had been thrown away by Connor, who never contacted him. Therefore, Connor was forced to break it in, then a fistfight broke out. After a long duel, Connor was able to calm his brother down and said that now he needed help. Pettis, the Mafia boss, has kidnapped his pregnant wife. Connor was ordered to steal $2 million from Pettis' rival if he wanted his wife to be safe. Connor was only given until tomorrow night, so he was pretty confused and asked for help from his younger brother. Connor's brother was still upset because he had been abandoned by his older brother for several months, and he even gave Connor a punch in the stomach. After that, they talked more seriously to plan a strategy. When Connor was still talking with his brother, suddenly there was a knock on the door. And when the door opened, it turned out it was Mason, their former captain when they were still in the Special Forces. Mason immediately asked if Connor was in trouble because his face looked very worried. Connor then told everything to Mason and luckily, Mason was willing to help him. After that, Mason quickly contacted two former members of his team, then asked them both to gather at the headquarters tomorrow morning. It was revealed that since the mission at the beginning of the film was considered a failure, Mason and his team had to be fired, so now they were separated. Connor was the one who stayed, and he also had to be transferred to become a police officer. However, in fact, Connor has also been fired since he killed one of Pettis' men. The next day, it showed that Mason and his former team members had gathered to help Connor. After that, Mason invited Connor to explain what they had to do. Connor immediately said that his wife had been kidnapped by Pettis, the Mayfay boss. If he wanted his wife to be safe, then Connor was ordered to rob money from Pettis' rival amounting to $2 million. Hearing Connor's explanation, they were willing to help, so they immediately prepared weapons to start their mission this evening. Shortly that evening, Mason and his team arrived at Pettis' rival headquarters. Mason immediately ordered Connor and the others to enter the building, and they started their action. It didn't take long for Mason and the team to successfully level them all and then take all the money that was stored behind the walls. Soon after that, Mason and the team had returned to their headquarters, then counted the money they had just stolen. But when they counted the money, it turned out that it was not exactly $2 million, but only $1.8 million. But fortunately, Connor had taken a bag of drugs, which would later be given to Pettis as a replacement for the money. The scene moved to Pettis, who was still waiting for Connor's arrival with the $2 million. Connor's wife was also there, but fortunately Pettis treated her well because he never hurt women. Even when Connor's wife asked Pettis to put out his cigarette, Pettis was willing to comply because he knew that Connor's wife was pregnant. Not long after that, Connor contacted Pettis, saying that he had managed to get all the money and he would immediately deliver it, but before that, Connor wanted to hear his wife's voice first, making sure that she was fine. Then, Pettis reminded Connor to come alone, without the police or anyone else. Connor could only come with his little brother. In the end, Connor would come with his little brother and immediately thanked Mason and the team because they wanted to help him. Mason also promised that he would always be on standby monitoring Connor. He would immediately follow them if something happened to Connor and his little brother at Pettis' place. In the end, Connor and his younger brother rushed to meet Pettis. On the way, Connor's younger brother asked Connor to stop at the toilet first because he needed to pee. But when Connor's brother was in the toilet, he instead used the drugs because it turned out that he was an addict. After that, Connor's brother returned to the car and continued his journey with Connor. A few minutes later, Connor and his younger brother arrived at Pettis' place and they were immediately checked by Pettis' men before going inside. After everything was considered safe, Connor and his younger brother were invited in to give the money. On the other side, Mason was on the way with one of his members. It turned out Mason had put a tracking device on Connor's car and now he was about to follow Connor. 
Mason had a bad feeling, so he would come to pet his headquarters. The scene then showed Connor and his younger brother who were already in Pettis' room. Here, Pettis asked his men to count the money first before they handed over Connor's wife. After counting the money, Pettis' man said that the money only amounted to $1.8 million, but Connor said that he would replace it with a bag of drugs. In the end, Pettis agreed and he immediately let Connor's wife go. After that, Pettis asked for a bag of drugs, which Connor promised, but the drugs were actually hidden by Connor's younger brother, who was a heavy addict. As a result, Pettis and his subordinates immediately held Connor and his brother at gunpoint. In the end, Connor and his younger brother chose to fight Pettis and his men. In the middle of the battle, Connor and his younger brother succeeded in finishing Pettis' men and went straight outside. Connor and his younger brother saw the shadows of two men behind the door, but when they were about to shoot them, it turned out that it was Mason and one of his members who had just arrived to help Connor. Mason then asked Connor's wife to wake here, while he and the others went inside to finish Pettis off and reclaimed the money. Fortunately, some of Pettis' men had managed to be finished by Connor. Therefore, Mason was easily able to make Pettis helpless in this way. In the end, Pettis was successfully held at gunpoint by Mason, Connor, and the others. Here, Pettis suddenly said that he knew a lot about the depravity of the government and corrupt officials in this country. If Mason agreed, they could work together to catch one of the corrupt officials who often collaborates with Pettis. Coincidentally, Pettis was fed up because the official often blackmailed him. Pettis also promised to return the $2 million as payment to Mason's team if they would help him. Mason then asked who was the corrupt official that Pettis meant and what was his plan. Pettis then said that the official was the police chief, Alston, who used to work with Mason. Every week, Alston always asked Pettis for security money, which was quite a large amount. In total, it might be around $15 million, and the money was kept in a private bank. Pettis' plan was to rob all the money, and if they were successful, the money would be divided evenly. Pettis also wanted to expose Alston's bad attitude as the police chief to the media, so that later, he could be punished as severely as possible. Mason, who really didn't like Alston, accepted the offer from Pettis, and from here on, they made peace. After that, Pettis took Mason and the team to the weapons room and invited them to use which weapon they wanted. Pettis said that they would start their mission tomorrow morning, so it would be better for Mason and the others to rest to recover their strength. The next day, Pettis and Mason and the gang were on their way to the bank where the police chief kept his money. However, it turned out that Alston, the corrupt police chief, was already in front of the bank because he was also planning to move all his money this morning. Pettis realized this, then he immediately blew up a car in front of the bank, then gunfire broke out. In this battle, one of Mason's men had to die, and Alston was also seen attacking while deploying his police officers to attack Mason and his team. Not long after, Pettis and Mason tried to enter the bank to take all of Alston's money. Pettis immediately threatened the bank manager to hand over all of Alston's money, but not the other customer's money. Pettis was always committed to his promises because all he wanted was Alston's money. After that, Pettis, Mason, and the team were trapped inside because outside the bank was surrounded by police and the SWAT team. So, like it or not, they had to go back to fighting, and this was their epic action. In the middle of the fight, Connor was targeted by the enemy sniper, but his younger brother swiftly saved him by sacrificing himself. When Connor saw his younger brother die, he could only cry uncontrollably because he really loved his younger brother. At the same time, suddenly a car came crashing into the bank. Apparently, it was a member of Mason's team who was late arriving. He quickly protected Mason and the team so they could escape from this bank. But unfortunately, when Mason and the others managed to escape, the man was actually shot by Alston. Alston even shot one of his colleagues who was always suspicious of him. Luckily, this was recorded by one of the detectives who was hiding. A few moments later, Mason's team had only Connor and Pettis left, and now they were heading to escape to the airport while carrying Alston's money. Mason realized that Alston and his men were chasing them, so he asked Connor and Pettis to run because the airport was quite close. There, Connor's wife and a pilot were waiting and ready to take off, 
while Mason would withstand the police attack. That was the only way they could escape and Mausen was willing to do this. There was no other choice, so in the end, Pettis and Connor left, while Mason immediately drove his car fast. In the end, Mason had to die because he was being shot by Alston and his team. Meanwhile, Pettis and Connor managed to get to the plane and then immediately took off with Connor's wife, who had been waiting. Several weeks later, the detective provided video evidence of Alston's crimes to the mayor. The detective also said that there were many more of Alston's crimes and he could prove it. As a result, the police chief, Alston, was immediately summoned and fired. Not only that, he would be punished. Seven months after the incident, Connor and his wife already have a baby. Pettis was also there because he chose to live with Connor and considered him like his own family. Then the film ends.